Okay, so I think this should be the final section of this lecture. I'm going to give two definitions which lead us to the concept of compact sets. And then I'm going to state the heine borel theorem, which uh, basically uh, places a very simple criterion on subsets of RK to, de to determine whether they're, um, whether they're compact, okay? Uh, I'm not going to prove the heine borel theorem as part of the lecture. I will upload a proof of it separately, but technically uh, you won't really be held responsible for it. It'll be more for those of you who really want to solidify your understanding of the theorem and your understanding of the concepts. And uh, I mean, I recommend that you familiarize yourself with it, but uh, technically uh, it'll be sort of extra. Uh, extra material. So let's talk about compact sets. So compact sets basically um, have to do with, uh, there, there are sets which um, if you sort of cover them with open sets, okay, then no matter what, no matter how you do it, you can always pick some of your open sets and, and end up with a, a, a finite collection of open sets that cover your set. So I know that doesn't really make sense right now, um, but so let me define what I mean by um, covering with open sets. So this is the first of these two definitions, okay? This is definition 13.11. Um, so let S D be a metric space. And I'll try to make this as thick with examples as possible. I think that this is a section of material that the book does a very bad job of uh, giving strong examples of. Um, and yeah, it, it's something that especially needs examples, I think. So, um, okay, a family U, and this is like a curly U. So I'll try to distinguish these. Um, a family U of open sets. Uh, in S, of course, is said to be an open cover of a set E in S if um, E is simply a subset of the union uh, of they do it this way, um, of all the sets, all the open sets, and there's a lot of U's floating around, so I'll try to explain. So U in U, uh, yeah, hopefully my handwriting. So this is a union, right? That's just an operation. Um, this is a normal U, and that represents an open set, and then the script U is the family of all the open sets. So, okay, first of all, to clarify, when we say family, it just means a set, actually. So the curly U just represents an, a, a set. But the reason we call it a family is because curly U is actually a set of sets, right? The elements of curly U, okay, is a set whose elements, emphasis on elements, are open sets in S, okay? So you might write curly U as something like U1, U2, U3, you know, so on. Except actually this is a little bit misleading too because a lot of the time we'll be interested in like, or not a lot of the time, but sometimes we're interested in families curly U that actually have an uncountable number of open sets in them. Um, or so, so something like, you know, uh, you, oops, don't want to make that look too curly. You are for, um, you know, R in R or something. So maybe there's actually one open set for every single real number or something like that. So you can't actually list them off like this. But the point is that the elements of curly U are open sets, okay? Never lose sight of that fact, okay? It's, I mean, it gets, a lot of people have a really hard time thinking about sets of sets when they first, you know, encounter this kind of thing. So I'm just trying to warn you 
that it's very important to keep it straight. Uh, so, okay, I, I also just want to re rewrite this a little bit differently over here. I don't, I don't like the book's notation here. So I'm going to show you how I would write this. Um, I would write union over u in curly u. Okay, that's supposed to be a curly u. Curly u of u. Okay. This, I think, is a much better way of writing this because this is just, I mean, I don't know. I, I'll probably, uh, I don't know, I'll probably try to stick to the books convention just to keep things straight, but I don't know if there's ever any confusion, maybe I'll switch to this one, we'll see. But anyway, yeah, I mean, you should think of like, you know, here it's like we're letting U range across all of the elements of curly U. Um, and we're just taking the union of all of those sets U, which are in the curly U. Okay, anyway, so that's enough about that. Um, let me show you an example, okay? So here's an example. Take E equals, you know, I don't know, uh, negative two, negative one, union, um, you know, uh, three, seven, let's make this one be closed actually. Okay, three, seven, uh, union, you know, I don't know, um, nine, whatever, right? So here's our set E, then one open cover of E would be U equals, you know, let's say uh, negative uh, five halves and, you know, negative one half, um, comma, um, negative 14, negative 10, comma, um, you know, one, four, comma, uh, seven halves, um, eight, comma, uh, you know, um, 8.5, okay, what is that, 19 halves, no, 17 halves, 17 halves, um, 10, and then like, I don't know, uh, 0, 40, sure, whatever, right, so why is this, what is the union here, it's going to be, you know, the union over all the u, okay, I'm just going to use this notation actually. So the union of all these sets is just like, you know, negative 14, negative 10, union, uh, negative five halves, negative one half, uh, union, um, you know, zero, uh, zero 40, I guess, right? because these three are actually just subsets of this one. But clearly, right, I mean, if you draw this out on the number line, clearly E, right, E is a subset of this, right? Because, I mean, well, this is a subset of uh, this one. This is a subset of um, either the union of, the, of, uh, of these two or uh, this one, if you want, right? And nine is obviously contained in this one and this one. Um, so clearly E is a subset of this. That's so, so U, the curly U is an open cover of E. Now I wanna point out a few things, right? First of all, look, several parts of E got covered multiple times, right? Like the interval three, seven was covered by these two intervals, but it's also covered by this one. So that's allowed, okay? Also, um, there are a bunch of intervals in here that like just don't even cover, like they don't intersect E at all, like negative 14, negative 10. What's that doing in there, right? It has nothing to do with E, but that's okay. Okay, that's the point. The open cover can have whatever subset, like whatever open sets you want. All that matters is that somehow, somehow or another, E itself is a subset of the union, okay? So that's an open cover, all right? 
it takes a little bit of getting used to. Okay, but look, look, let me just point out also, U has how many sets? One, two, three, four, five, six. Six elements. So this is a finite cover. Okay, so let's, um, let's proceed now. So now I'm gonna just define compactness, okay? So, um, right. So first of all, so actually, this is still part of definition 13.11, I guess. So definition 13.11 continued. Um, so a subcover of U, which is an open cover of E, right? So we're still talking about open covers of a set E, okay? A subcover of an open cover of a set is a sub subfamily, which is really just a subset, a subset of U, uh, which, hold on, it's a subset it's a subfamily of U or AKA a subset of U, right? Which also covers E, okay? Um, so I'll, I'll, let me just state the compactness uh, criterion and then I'll uh, go back to the example and show you um, something. So um, E is compact if for any, in for any not not even infinite just for any for any open cover u there is some finite subcover of u Okay, so again, I mean, it still has to, it has to be a subcover in the sense that the finite subcover has to cover E, okay? So U is an open cover of E and it might have an infinite number of open sets. The point is if E is compact, no matter what U is, okay? Even if there's an infinite number of sets in it, you can toss almost every single set out of U and still have a subcover, still have an open cover of E, okay? and you'll only have like a finite number of sets left. Okay, so let me just go back to the example, which by the way, this E is not a compact set, okay? But I wanna just tell you about like subcovers a little bit, okay? Um, so let's, so let's talk about subcovers. Let's look at some examples of subcovers, okay? Um, say U prime, is just the set, um, you know, negative five halves, negative one half, and zero forty. Okay. Um, then U prime is a subcover of E, right? Or a subcover. Sorry, it's, it's really a subcover of U. But I mean, it's it's an open cover of E. Uh, right? So it covers E and also notice, so this set, this open set is also inside of U. This open set is also an element. This open set is an element of U and this open set is an element of U as well, right? So U prime is, a, is actually a subset of U, right? So that means it's a subcover. Now let's look at a, an example of not a subcover. So say U double prime is, you know, negative five halves, negative one half, and, you know, um, one uh, 18, I don't know, 
okay? This is not a subcover of u. Okay, even though, so one, one comma 18 is a subset of zero comma 40, right? But the problem is one comma 18 is not an element of u, right? Look through these open sets. Where do you see one comma 18? It's nowhere, okay? So u double prime has an open set, which is not in u. So it's not an open subcover. It's not a subcover, right? It does cover E, which is nice. So it is an open cover. U double prime is an open cover of E, but it's not a subcover of U, okay? Uh, so hopefully you're sort of getting the hang of this. One other thing about this, right? So I said E is not compact, and that's actually hard to prove, okay? It, it's a hard thing to prove that, um, or rather, no, sorry. It's not that hard to prove that E isn't compact, but it's hard to prove that E is compact, okay? But look at this. So we have a finite cover, right? U, U is a finite cover, right? So like, why is that, right? I mean, why isn't E compact? We have a finite cover, right? But the, the, if you go back to the definition, definition of compactness, it's saying any open cover U, there is some finite subcover, right? For any open cover U. So that can be a lot of different things, right? Open covers, there, there's a lot of possibilities of what an open cover could be. We're only looking at one open cover here. You actually can't even conclude anything about a set just from looking at a single open cover, unless that open cover has no finite subcover, in which case you can show that the set isn't, uh, isn't compact. So if we wanted to show that E wasn't compact, we would, have to, we would have to look at an infinite open cover of E because we have to dream up some open cover which has no finite subcover. This open cover does have a finite subcover because it's literally already finite. So it's a really bad, like, this would be a, a failed attempt to show that E isn't compact, right? Let me show you an example of showing a set isn't compact. So showing a set isn't compact. Um, so it's, this is easier than showing a set is compact, but so consider zero one, okay? Let me draw a picture. I'm gonna cut and uh, I'll draw a picture. Okay, so I've kind of tried to layer the, uh, the sets uh, over each other in a way that makes them kind of easily visible, right? But each of these sets, each of the different colored sets is supposed to be um, like one of the color, one of the sets in uh, in the family U. So this might be like U one. This might be U two. Um, this might be U three, and then this might be U four, right? And so on. And they get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. But uh, eventually, but so, so like the whole infinity of them actually do end up covering this interval when you take the union of all of them. But the problem is if you leave out, right, if you look at these, the way they're constructed, I mean, I haven't given hard numbers here, but you can kind of imagine a way of like writing down formulas that'll make this work where the way they're constructed is that like, uh, for each one of these intervals, there are some points which actually are only covered by that single interval, right? So like for the, for the red interval, there are points over here that are only covered by the red interval, right? For the green interval, there are points over here that are only covered by the green interval. Of course, there's some overlaps, but there's also points that are like unique to each interval, right? So like these points in the middle of the blue one are only covered by the blue one. And the same thing would be true for each, every single interval in this entire cover. So the way it's constructed is so that there is no finite subcover. In fact, not only is there no finite subcover, there's actually no proper subcover. So if you throw out even a single one of these open sets, um, you're gonna be leaving points out of the cover as soon as you do that because of the points in the middle of each interval that need that one interval to cover them, right? So, uh, so zero one is not compact. So I just really want to remind you guys that when we prove a set isn't compact, it's enough to give a single open cover, which has no finite subcover. 
But if we want to show that a set is compact, we have to show for every possible open cover that there is a finite subcover. Okay, it's not enough just to give a single infinite cover and then give a finite subcover of that one and say, okay, the set's compact because there is a finite subcover. Right? You have to do it for every single possible open cover. Okay, uh, it's really easy for people to lose track of that fact. So, okay, the very last thing I'm going to do is just state the heine borel theorem and maybe say a few words, and then we'll leave it at that for this lecture, because I know it's already a bit long, and I'm sorry for that. Um, so let me state the heine borel theorem. Um, a subset of RK is compact if and only if it is closed and bounded. Okay, so for example, you know, zero one is compact in R or like, uh, you know, the, the unit ball or something, right? The set of like x, y, z, such that um, square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared is less than or equal to one uh, is compact in R3. Um, Q intersect zero, one is not compact in R um, because it's not closed. And, uh, you know, something like zero infinity is not compact in R because it's not bounded, right? So these are just some examples of compact and non-compact sets. It's really easy to tell when a set is compact if you know the heine borel theorem, right? So you don't have to really think about covers and stuff. Uh, if you're just trying to tell whether a set is compact, you can use the heine borel theorem. However, you might be asking yourself, okay, well, what was the whole point of these uh, covers and stuff? Why did we have to define compactness that way if it turns out that it's just so easy to describe when a set is compact? And what I'll tell you is that later on, it becomes extremely useful to be able to take a closed and bounded set and then use the definition of compactness to say something about open covers of that set, okay? That becomes a very powerful thing. So that's why we defined compactness the way we did because it becomes useful later to be able to talk about that. It becomes useful to talk about open covers and taking finite subcovers. Okay, the very, very last thing I'm gonna do is just go back to this. I wanna go back to this example. Because the weird, it might be weird to you guys to think about like, why is this not compact? But then as soon as you add um, zero and one to the set, right? Then it is compact. What changes, right? How is it that as soon as we add zero and one, then like making any new cover of it will uh, have will get will give us like some finite subcover. Let's just think about like trying to, you know, so let's add zero and then let's add one. Okay. So with zero, it's really easy, you know, to just throw in some interval, right? And that doesn't really do anything to cover zero, right? Because as it stands, these sets don't cover zero or one. They only cover the open interval from zero to one. Okay. So we can just throw in some random little interval here. And that's fine. It's still the res the rest of it still like has no finite subcover except that we haven't covered the point one. But now, if you think about what happens if we try to cover the point one, right, is we have to put some kind of interval around one, okay? And if we put an interval around one, um, you know, no matter how small we make the interval around one, look, almost all of these sets like all of this like infinity sets that are covered that are like it represented by these three dots get absorbed into this one interval that we put around around one right 
And so then there's just like a finite collection of sets outside of that or like overlapping it, but outside, which we can use to cover the entire interval. And that's like, no matter how small you make this interval, that ends up happening. You just eat up like an infinite amount of these uh, open intervals that are sitting in these like three dots here, right? And so that's really at the heart of the issue is that like, if you have a closed and bounded set, no matter how, tr how you try to like construct a crazy open cover like this, there's gonna end up being like some special like problem point somewhere where if you put an open interval around that point, it ends up like eating up like an infinite collection of your sets basically. That's kind of like a vague idea of why closed and bounded sets have to be compact, okay? Anyway, so that's probably enough for this lecture. Like I said, I will try to upload uh, some kind of a nice explanation of the proof of the heine borel theorem, but you aren't really responsible for it. You should know the theorem though. So know this. Okay, all right, so that's all. See you in the next lecture.